Um, I, before I uh, kind of get into uh, what we're going to talk about and introduce the panel, I think if, since we're such a small group, it'd be good to just sort of go around, have you say who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. It, it, yeah. Uh, I know your audience, right? <laughs> Great. I didn't expect this. Um, I'm Diane Howell, and um, I have worked for an architecture slash engineering firm, large and long firm, in terms of the architecture field. So I'm interested in lead and those types of things. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm happy to be here. I'm her sister, Jennifer Kubak. I live in Denver, and I'm here just to get a wide view about all the topics. Uh, Mike Legans, I'm from Cleveland, and uh, starting a company that smell, or sells sorry, uh, small wind turbines. Turbines. I'm Mary Kenyon with Real Time Marketing here in Aspen, and I've been hired by the city of Aspen to help them with their building performance initiative that actually starts on Friday. Uh, hi, I, I'm Amada Babse. I'm from Jordan, and I'm uh, the head of Environment and Energy Unit at UNDP. I'm Shar Horst, wife of Scott, and um, I'm interested in issues of green building and social equity. I'm Chelsea Motter, and I teach high school um, at Shiprock High School on the Navajo, Navajo Nation. Hi, I'm Samira Savarella. I work with the Chicago Department of Transportation in their bicycle and pedestrian uh, program, specifically focusing on elementary education. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Meyer. I work with the Denali Commission in Anchorage, Alaska. We do uh, rural development in uh, Alaska. Hi, my name is Ashley Dean. I'm a second year master's student at the Donald Brunn School of Environmental Science and Management and interested in entering the field of green building. Good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth Oliver Farrow, and I own the Oliver Group, an environmental communications and public policy company, and I represent the tower companies. Hello, I'm Celia Stoltz, and my husband sits on the panel, and I'm having an art gallery in Switzerland. Hi, everyone, my name is Amanda Rosenberg. I am studying environmental engineering at Brown as an undergrad, and working um, in a group for consulting for community development in Providence. Hi, my name is Olivia Siegel, and I work for the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Hello, my name is Melanie. I'm from Mexico, and we're here because we're really uh, we're starting a pilot green city in Mexico. We already have budget from the federal government, so we're here to learn, and we're really thankful for your your thoughts on that. I'm Jose. I'm Melanie's brother, and come together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Barrett Oski. I'm president of Affinity Lab. We're a shared sustainable office space, currently just in Washington, D.C., but we're expanding nationally. Hi, I'm Laurel Gutenberg, and I'm with the Agroecology Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Hi, Andrew Travers. I'm a reporter with the Aspen Daily News right here in Aspen. Kevin Smith. Uh, my family owns a small farm outside of Portland, Oregon. Jason Haver, I'm with the Town of Snowmass Village. I'm the Town's Economic Resource Director. I uh, work on capital project management and policy development, and also sit on the uh, board of the Community Office for Resource Efficiency. My name is Jeffrey Burkus. I'm the architect of Adore Hosier Center and an architect and board member of, of ACES here in town. I'm Rebecca Nolan. I'm a lead certified landscape architect. I moved here to Aspen and I am currently unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nick Kisslinger. I uh, work on a team in Los Angeles on higher education policy, climate change, and green private equity. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Stewart. I'm also based out of LA. I work for a firm called Cosmopolis and we do sustainable urban development and currently working on a retrofit policy in Los Angeles. Hi, my name is Sean Arian. I'm a Los Angeles Mayor Villaraigosa's Director of Economic Development. Hello, hey everybody. My name is Michael Cox. I'm with the California Student Sustainability Coalition. And we've uh, worked in partnership with the UC Board of Regents, University of California Board of Regents, to develop the most comprehensive sustainability policy in higher education over the last seven years. My name is Kabira Stokes. I'm with Green for All, and we're working on building a green economy that's inclusive enough to lift people out of poverty. I'm based out of LA, and we um, 
I work on media and communications. Um, okay. Um, if you don't sit at the table, you can't introduce yourself. <laughs> no, just joking. Okay. Um, no, 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 no. Let me uh, let me get started because uh, it, I'm happy to see more people came in. Um, you know, when we got together this morning, we were all talking about how different our panel is. I think than all the other panels that we've seen since we've been here. I mean, what we've been hearing a lot about policy, about what you can do, what you can't do. Um, we represent a very different segment of the market where we're much more on the demand side and we're doing a lot of things. We have a lot of programs in place and there's a lot of recognition in the real estate community and the development community, uh, especially I think that, that we have to do something to really mitigate climate change, have to have more conservation, more energy efficiency. So let me just uh, give you a, a couple of facts and figures to start you off with. Um, the building sector is an enormous consumer of energy according to the Environmental Information Administration annual 2008 energy outlook. All buildings, including residential, represent 39% of U.S. primary energy use and account for 38% of all CO2 emissions. Further, buildings consume 72% of the U.S. electricity consumption, consume 40% of all of our potable water, and contribute significantly to the raw material consumption and waste. Commercial buildings, specifically, represent roughly half of the consumption measures stated by the EIG. And the interesting thing is that many of us spend more time at work than we do at home yet we behave very differently at home than we do at work. So we need to start to change that mindset about how you behave at work. Um, presently, the total square footage of U.S. commercial buildings is over 70 billion square feet. I mean, that's an astonishing number when you think about that. This room right here is maybe 1,200 square feet. So it's an incredible number and an incredible opportunity to create change. So ensuring peak energy performance in existing buildings will remain vitally important to the nation's cost containment strategies, greenhouse gas reduction strategies, and job creation strategies. So with me today, uh, we have four leaders in this industry from very diverse fields. We have a mayor, we have a raider, we have a researcher, we have a developer. So just starting here on the end with uh, Jeffrey Abramson. He's with the Tower Company. And I have known Jeffrey for a number of years. He's actually a client of mine. We're both from the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, he's a visionary. He was doing green way before it was cool, far before it was cool, probably 20 years ago. And now he's doing things that are beyond green. Uh, he's uh, uh, very interested and, and pursues a vision of Vedic ar architecture, and he will talk about that, and he will tell us how we can incorporate that, not only into our buildings, but into our cities and our lifestyle and planning. Um, next to Jeffrey is Roland Stoltz with Nova Atlantis. On Wednesday evening, if you were here, you probably heard him uh, give the big idea of the 2000 Watt Society, a wonderful program uh, in Switzerland that is reducing personal energy consumption uh, across the country. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that and how we can take that program and put it here, how we can use those principles. Uh, next is uh, Scott Hurst, uh, who has recently joined uh, the U.S. Green Building uh, Practice from uh, U.S. Green Building Council for Private Practice. Uh, Scott was implemental in the creation of the LEED rating system. He's head of the steering committee, and which if all of you probably, who doesn't know what LEED is? Okay, good. So everybody knows it's a wonderful tool and uh, to really map out how we can create greener buildings and uh, greener cities. And finally is our host mayor, Mick Ireland. And Mick has worked hard to ensure programs are in place that maintain the pristine environment of Aspen. They have lots and lots of things that they're doing here. Uh, we'll hear what they're doing as well as some of the concerns he has with uh, things that other people aren't doing that are affecting change in his environment. So with that, let's begin with our Swiss guest who came the farthest. Uh, Roland, tell us how we might be able to bring the 2000 Watt Society to the United States, the principles, and what it would take to really put that in place. You might want to give a little introduction to what it is um, before talking about that. OK, thank you, Sally. Uh, I'll try to give a short introduction what it means. It's a simple 
uh, name, but it's a kind of a complex implementation of this uh, whole system of the 2000 Watt Society. The world average annual energy consumption per capita per person on this world is about uh, 18,000 kilowatt hours. That equals to some 400 gallons of gasoline, so it's not much. And uh, this is an equivalent to a continuous consumption of 2,000 watt. Because what is power? It's not energy. And that makes it a little bit complicated. But it's easier to understand. It's, it's easy to keep in, in mind these 2,000 watt. So just forget about all the physics. It's 2,000 watt is a metaphor, is a, is a vision for a sustainable future, for sustainable urban development. That's what we try to tell the people, to show the people how it can happen. And we... Uh, uh, develop projects for buildings, for uh, transportation systems, and for neighborhood developments together with cities and private entrepreneurs. And why 2000 Watt? Why should we reach 2000 Watt and where are we today? In Bangladesh, the people have uh, uh, a need of, of, or a demand of 200 Watt per capita. In India, it's a thousand watt. Growing, of course, quickly growing. In uh, China, it's uh, almost 2,000. Brazil, it's 2,000. Europe, 6,000. So it's three times the world average. And North and America, 12,000. We're number one somewhere. Yeah, I'm right. So, uh, so we have a long way to go. Yeah, 12, I think all of us. You know, right? because <laughs> this is the this is the, the national average. But if you compare uh, people who live in the cities who fly like us, my consumption is far beyond six thousand watts. Now, because now when, when you, I fly to these places uh, all over. The, so when you you take the the two thousand watts, you include the travel, and it's almost it's almost like a carbon footprint in essence. It's, it is right. a, It is a carbon footprint. Right. It's, okay. And so and, and how does that translate into to carbon then, or, or can you uh, really do that? Carbon footprint uh, in in Europe would be uh, around eight to ten tons per, per capita person. per person, and uh, in North America it's about double as well. It's, and um, so what it means, it is a long way for all of us to go. And what we now did is that we set up a system how this could happen. We showed, we made a study, which technologies are available can, these can days. Can I ask you just a question? What did you start with before you went to the 2000? Well, we start with our, in Switzerland, with these 6,000. With 6,000. So, we, so you went from 6 to 2. We want to go from okay. 6 okay. to 2. We are far, okay. Okay. <laughs> still far away from that, you know. But, um, and that's somehow, it's, it's uh, very similar to uh, President Obama's uh, new wish to reduce it by 80%, you know, in, in, I don't know, 30 years, 50 years, which is very ambitious and which is now also accepted in, in Europe, European Union. They want to reduce it by 80% in the next 50 years. So it's becoming a common sense that it should be done this way, although it's, it's very, very, very uh, right. So demanding. how do you get there? How do you get from six so to two? We have, uh, we have designed a system, uh, uh, the possibilities, and uh, we showed them to some partners. And uh, this uh, system includes uh, housing, office buildings, hospitals, and we show uh, the benchmarks which have to be met to become a 2,000 watt hospital, for instance, uh, or the benchmarks for 2,000 watt uh, housing, or for neighborhoods. Uh, or for uh, transportation solutions. And it's know. in terms of energy efficiency within the It buildings? is mainly in terms of energy efficiency. So it could be in addition to LEED, for instance. And, um, but the, this is the more technical aspect, the quantitative aspect. But I think 
what uh, the past two years have shown, uh, what is even more important is the political aspect of it. Because six years ago, I went to the city of Basel and told them this, this idea, this vision of a 2,000 watt society. Would you be interested? And they said, oh, okay, we know these, all, these theories coming from the visions coming from the universities, that's all theory. And so I tell them, why don't we try it and start with one neighborhood and then find out whether it works or not. So since that moment, since six years, Basel is, has become a 2,000 watt partner and is investing every year more money and convincing more people in the city and in the region to do the same thing. And uh, it is adapting and integrating the 2,000 watt theories into their political uh, activities. Excuse me, is it, is it something that the um, city has to invest in? Is it uh, like an expense? Is it expensive to do? Um, it depends on, on what you do. It's, it is like, for instance, for buildings, it is like doing lead platinum is the best practice. Lead platinum, and well, in terms of kilowatt hours per square foot, it's um, around three kilowatt hours per square foot for heating, cooling, hot water, and lighting. So it's not much. Mm -hmm. That's the demand, you know, and uh, that's the part you can cover with CO2 um, linked uh, energy. So what um... Well, I just want to comment on that because that's kind of interesting. We were having a conversation about this earlier um, today, and uh, I'm, my field is, is really doing brokerage and doing deals and leases and things like that, and I've negotiated a number of green leases, and we actually just finished doing the U.S. Green Building headquarters. And the, when we go out for a request for a tenant, we typically ask for five watts for power and two watts for lighting load. And now we've just done the U.S. Green Building Council, and they're using about a half watt on the lighting load, per and about foot. per square foot, and about two and a half watts on the plug load, which is your three watts per square foot. That you know, it, 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 and so it can be done. But I think a lot of what it is is this you have this reality of what people really use, and people are thinking they're using the same thing that they used in the 90s or the 80s and before Energy Star equipment or before more efficient lights and things like that. And so I think what we really have to do is start to say, what do we really need to have? And not just let it be sort of a market or an entitlement of what we ought to have. Right, I think that's very important that we really set very clear benchmarks and we make it transparent. Right. And, uh, like we have now for, the, for buildings, uh, we got that from Germany. Germany started with that, with an energy passport for each building, you know? Right. So when you sell a building, when you resell a building, you have to show the passport of the building. And if it's a, a very, uh, with a very high energy consumption, then uh, it's more difficult to sell it again. So I think there is so many well, it, tools to do that, yeah, you know. And, and, and that kind of it. thing is going on all over the country in New York and Washington, D.C., having the, energy, the EPA Energy Star program, having your building benchmark registered or having some sort of level of, uh, of a rating is critical, and, and it has to become transparent before you sell your building and even to the point in some markets where tenants have to know what the energy consumption is of the building before they go into it. And this kind of stuff, this awareness out in, in the public sector, I think is what's going to help fuel these types of ideas mm -hmm. out there and, and the buy-in to that. Yeah. And so I think there's many, many other things to do. Sure. But what I would just like to, in a nutshell, to, to finish my story sure. about these three cities. And your question was, how could we transform that, sure. tra transfer that to, to the United States? Uh, so first I went to Basel, and then after a couple of years, and six years ago it was much more difficult to explain to people what 2,000 Watt Society is and that it would be useful to do that, much more difficult. It has changed two years ago with uh, uh, Al Gore's movie uh, and, uh, and Price. 
Yes, cost of energy, cost of energy and uh, some reports, and the, 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 the storm in... Uh, Katrina. Katrina, right. yes. That has changed a lot, even yes. in, in Europe as well. Hmm. So people became aware. And then, after that, I went to Zurich and told them, look, look Basel, they are always a little bit fighting between each other. And so I told them, look what Basel, Basel is doing. Like going from mom to father, to, pa, right. or to father, you know, telling mom, I said, and uh, you could uh, well, as well, you know. And uh, then in, in Zurich, they said, OK, sounds like a good idea. Why don't we think about it? And then I went to Geneva and said, look, the German-speaking cities do that. Why don't you do that? <laughs> and that's the way it happened, you know? It's, it's as simple as that, you know? Right. And, uh, and as I explained uh, on the mountain uh, the first day, first night, uh, each city has now its very specific own way to do it and has defined its own goals. And we are now... Um, somehow coordinating these goals and now setting up the rules for all over Switzerland. Because and then in, in Zurich, uh, I said that, that this evening already, uh, they organized the public vote. That happens all the time in Switzerland for everything. You have to vote. And uh, they asked the, uh, the people, do you want to integrate the 2000 Watt Society as a political goal in the municipal um, convention. And uh, there was a 77% yes. That almost never happens in Switzerland, you know, because there are so many nice right. that, uh, but normally it's about 52 to 48 or something like that. Right. And since that, we have about almost every other week a request from a town saying, well, if Zurich says 75% yes or 77%, why shouldn't we, right. shouldn't we do it? Now, requests coming from Germany. So it's a snowball system, sure. you know? And when you ask me how could it be transferred to the United States, I think it would be the best way, I think, the most feasible way would be to start with one town. It's a grassroots organization. It's a grassroots Right, thing. it's very much that. And sometimes it's uh, top-down organized, sometimes bottom-up, and right. it could be Aspen. Well, because so we are now talking to Sam Moritz. That's your competitor in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, so, in Switzerland. So, and sister city, pal. Is so, it? Yeah, <laughs> sister city. So you should do it both, you know? It's even so, better. Mick, tell me, what would the obstacles of doing a program like this be here other than, you know, I don't know how many people, um, what's the population, full-time population here? Well, the latest estimate our full-time population is about 6,500 and when we're when we're full at peak time, it's about thirty thousand. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the biggest obstacle in any of these programs is not resistance by the public, but communication to the public how how to do it. And we really have two two communication barriers. We have, as you probably noticed if you looked outside, uh, some really large homes, <laughs> and um, and they're. Uh, they consume a certain amount of power depending on their age and their use and so on. They, uh, those homeowners are not adverse to doing the right thing, but they don't have the traditional feedback loops that you use for regulatory uh, constraint. If, 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 you, if, if you want to cut water consumption in the city of Denver, use tiered electric rates. And just tell people, the more water you use, it's a progressive rate, and you're going to be paying a whole lot for that last gallon of water. It works. Right. Same with electricity. So we did that here. We did tiered water rates. Now we're doing tiered electric rates. The big users don't notice. And the reason they don't notice is not because they don't care about saving money, and not because they want to ruin the environment, and not because they're indifferent to the plant, but because the bill for the electric rates doesn't even go to them. So I'm an attorney, and I represent people like this. And typically, the expenses go to an accountant. The guy may be in Michigan or Hawaii or something, and he just pays the bill. He does not call the client and say, do you realize you're paying an extra $68 a month for your water? Do you know that? No, you do not call the client with that. Those clients do not want to talk to you unless it's really important. So that's, that's a feedback problem. For the people at the other end of the spectrum, like myself, I live in, in uh, 650 or so square feet of affordable housing. You know, I, I just think of it as paradise 
it's, it's what I want. I can fit all my bikes inside, and, you know, and my skis and my couch, and then I don't have to spend any time in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank God I was not good at piano lessons when I was a kid, because <laughs> I'd be sleeping on the deck. But for my, my group of people, the, the obstacle is, is a knowledge barrier. Sure, I want to do this, but am I going to spend the afternoon uh, doing telephone tag and email tag with people who can do an energy audit for me and then do a whole series of web searches and stuff to find somebody who can do the things that are recommended for me and then, then lay out a bunch of money that has a payout period of, say, seven years or 14 years. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be here in seven years or 14 years in this 600-square-foot house. You know, I, I might have a girlfriend. I might need 900 square feet. You know, it's, it's, it, that's a different set of obstacles. Now, what, what, we're, what we're doing to overcome that, you know, I, I don't know whether we would get to 2,000 watts as a standard. Um, you know, I have a real problem communicating to the public numbers as it is and to tell them what 2,000 watts is uh, and what that relates to. It's near impossible. The public is not quantitatively trained in this country, nor are most public officials. Um, if you want to put them, to, if you want to flatline a public official, bring them some budget matter, bring them some numbers. Now, to communicate to my group of people how I can do this, and to com communicate with the people who have the bigger houses, what we're trying to do, what we're using our tiered electric rates for, are uh, home energy audits, free, and you get the audit, and then you get connections with. Uh, people who are certified that you know if you call this guy, he can actually do weather stripping and he's not, he's not a grifter or you know, whatever those guys who go from town to town. He's, he's not selling aluminum siding. Hmm. What we think our obstacle is we have to package all this so it's really easy for people. Now, I don't know how many of you have this experience. I have it all the time. I'm on the internet and they want me to do something and it's $2 or $1 it's free. I don't want to spend 10 minutes filling the required fields. Mm -hmm. Any have that experience? Yeah, okay, and then correcting because I didn't put my home phone number or something like that. Or, or you my click it code. and you forgot something and you have to start over. <laughs> All that. And believe me, the, the typical person living in affordable housing, we surveyed this repeatedly, is working 52 hours a week, okay? 1.3 jobs. And during the season, it's, it's, it's really two jobs. I, haven't, I have not lived here in 30 years without having two jobs except when I worked for a guy who made it feel like three jobs. <laughs> and uh, that is their life, and they are not going to spend hours and hours, most of them, you know, comparing solar panel installation firms and prices per kilowatt hour. They're not going to do that. They can't do that. We shouldn't ask them that. We have to make it easy. So that's our goal, is to make it one-stop shopping. Whether we get to 2,000 watt uh, or some, some goal that, that they don't understand, um, is, is a different story, but we, we can get a long way, but I think our job in pu public officials is to make it easy for people to do the right thing, because most of them want to do the right thing. When we ask for people to tax themselves to, to double our hydro plant capacity, they overwhelmingly approved it. And when we asked them for money, and we added FTEs, full-time equivalent workers, and we did a mill levy so that we could trap the runoff from our streets and put it through filters and bio ponds before it got in, in the river, they voted overwhelmingly to tax themselves. They will do the right thing, but you've got to package it in a way they understand. And uh, that's, our, you know, that's our mission here. Yeah, so, so let's sort of take this conversation and turn it to a building owner, a developer. You have millions of square feet um, you know, in, on the East Coast, and, uh, it, but, and your tenants are kind of like your taxpayers in a way. And so how do you incentivize them to behave better within the building? And, and you know, when typically you find that submetering isn't common around there, so people don't know what they're paying, and they're just passing it through, they feel like they have no control, so they leave the lights on. And it goes back to this whole thing of you behave very differently at work than you do in the office place. So what is, Jeffrey, what are some of the things that you're doing to, to help manage that issue? Well, I think the simple answer is, is that people are not doing it. And if you uh, manage and own large buildings, as you started off in your introduction, uh, the people who own these large buildings can make a huge impact as the management and owner 
and that one individual can never make. And we have apartments. We have the old style apartments built in the 1960s with central plants. They were not separately metered apartments, which means there is no awareness at all of what the costs are to operate your apartment because you don't get a bill. And there is scientific evidence that says that the greatest form of reduction of energy is to get your electric bill, and you will reduce it by 25% if you know how much you're spending. And so now we're in a dilemma because we're about to renovate to lead EV standards, 1,400 apartments. Do we spend $3,000 an apartment and add these wireless devices that will then send them the bill, and therefore then we're less competitive in the marketplace because we always had free utilities and people and utilities are becoming very expensive? Or should we just spend the money on energy efficiency and just know that the footprint of our apartments is distinctly different than anyone else and market that to those who are interested in supporting that kind of environment? And that's really what we focused on is really greening and educating the public about what they can do by being in our buildings. Same thing in the, in the office buildings. What's happening now because Numbers now are becoming more important because dollars are what's being counted. Before, we didn't really care. And I think before, we were all moving so fast that no one really cared because there'd be plenty of money. So what's happening is the new deals, this is what Sally is saying, the tenants are calling up and saying, there's many places I can go. What is the amount of consumption your building has? And I'm going to be paying those costs, and I'm going to be paying the future costs. And they start comparing building to building. So what's happening is something very exciting, which I call an industrial revolution. It's a new one. Buildings are now going to start competing on, on their carbon footprint and the amount of money it costs to operate that. And at the same time, 50% of the consumption of electricity in a building is the actual tenant. The other 50% is the operating the, the central aspects of the building. They're now starting to say, what can I do? And a lot of the reasons why they're starting to say, what can I do to green my office is because many of them are international organizations. And the change is coming from Europe. And their European parents are saying, what are you doing? Because I, this corporation, want to look good in the eyes of America. So what we do now in our company is we issue a report card. And we actually show total transparency what we as a company are doing and what we and all our buildings are doing to make the transformations. We are one of only 13 carbon neutral com uh, companies in America. I don't say that for you to be proud of me. I say that to show you how bad America is. That somebody like me, a few million square feet of office space, would be one of only 13 in America. And how we do it, it's a mathematical game. You just buy 92% of your uh, uh, energy. You offset it through wind. wind. We're the largest consumer of any real estate developer in the United States of wind. They're in the top 25 in the country. Um, and the other is offset, used to be by uh, methane destruction, and now it's uh, capturing landfill uh, gas. So what we're doing, what we find, it's much easier to change ourselves. And then we make a sea change. We make it transformational. That's the power of the commercial real estate industry. That's the power that I feel, because if we're the biggest polluters, we also can make the biggest contribution. And the way to do that is, is lifting everyone up at one time. And that's the power of the right. big buildings. And that's, I mean, at CB, Richard Ellis, we have a carbon neutral commitment as well by 2010. Um, and we made this commitment in 2007, and it, it's for our own companies. We, we're a Fortune 500 company. We have uh, over 30,000 people. We have 450 offices globally. We measured every single office. We know our travel footprint. Um, and we didn't make the commitment to be carbon neutral on day one because we wanted to develop a strong process to understand how you maximize energy efficiency operation renewables before you get to the point of buying RECs. And it's, it's an offering that you know, we're, we're working to put into our corporate clients. In the, in the US alone, just to give you scale, we manage 1.3, in North America, 1.3 billion square feet of property. 
in the United States. 2% of the population works in the C.B. Richard Allison so building. So when we do stuff like this, the rest of the real estate community follows, and it makes a huge difference. So it, that, that's very important. But it doesn't matter what we do as, land, as, as managers of buildings, because 60% of the energy consumption comes from the tenants. So that communication tool you know, is really important. And I think just kind of switching over to talk a little bit about the lead rating system and the new lead and how this can help you know, kind of propel the notion of better energy efficiency. Scott, tell us a little bit about you know, some of the criticism LEED's had in the past, the history of it, the transformation to LEED 2009, and how it's going to help with the communication and really the energy efficiency side. Before I go there, Sally, I, I actually <clears throat> want to talk about the magnitude of the, of the potential. If you took all the commercial construction that happened in 2007, which was a lot, um, and reduced its energy consumption by 70%, it would be equal to reducing the existing building market by 1%. So if you, what, basically what that means is everyone in this room is totally empowered to make a huge difference as long as everyone in this room does something. So before I talk about LEED, I, I want to just say a couple things about our overall thinking and kind of what I've been getting out of this conference. My favorite part of this conference so far is when we went, went around this room and just mm -hmm. to hear who's in this room. And I have to say that so far represented in here, and I don't mean to be ageist in, it, in any way, but we have the youngest group that I've seen at this conference. Yeah. And we also have a group of doers, people that are out there doing stuff, working on actual projects all the time or kind of in the trenches or young people that are feeling part of this movement. So one thing I've gotten out of this conference so far is something we get as that we, we tend to do as environmentalists, which is, it's, I call it sort of the earth is our car mentality, and if only we can send it to the right shop, it'll get fixed. <laughs> and so we're looking for these big ideas, these huge levers that somehow will fix the problem, like somehow there's this solution out there, and if we just do this one whiz-bang thing, it's all over, and we got it all fixed, and everything's fine. But what happens a lot of times is that big idea becomes sort of the ruse to keep you from dealing with all the billions of little ideas that can happen. Right. So what we're about is all these billions of little ideas, what happens every day, those waterless urinals that you have over in the Dozier Center that cost less to install, cost less to operate, cost less to um, whatever, and they don't use any water. Every year. Right. right. Every year, year after year after year. Billions and billions of little ideas. So I was thinking about puzzles. And I never liked puzzles. But when I'd sit down to do them with my children, what would usually happen is we'd put the big pieces together and we'd get bored. And there'd be this whole table of all these little pieces left over. And then after a couple weeks, it'd be sitting there and we'd shove it back in the box. Sometimes maybe my kids would have the patience to sit there and do it. Buildings are the billions of little pieces, and all of the work that you do are the billions of little pieces. Now, the reason I like LEED is because LEED is a transformational tool that's about engagement. It's not about fixing. It's not about the answer. It's about getting people to do things that they've never thought about doing before. And if you talk to people who have done LEED, the reason I like LEED is because in private practice, and I'm, I'm just, next week I'm going to become senior vice president for LEED, so my life is changing. But in private practice, <laughs> what's happened is in countless LEED meeting after LEED meeting where we're setting goals for the project, what happens is some engineer sits there and goes, oh, he makes some integrated connection about how if he deals with loads differently than he had dealt with them before and he gets to the certain level he can downsize the system, and it's going to be cheaper than it would cost, and it's going to cost less to operate. My, my favorite session so far was with Amory Lovins. Amory Lovins has had this vision for how we can do this for 20 years. We, all we should be doing is talking to Amory Lovins and figuring out how to implement his vision. <laughs> That's all we should be doing. So I guess to go back to LEED then, yeah, there are a lot of criticisms about LEED because LEED can get in the way sometimes. It's sort of like uh, any tool. Any tool can get in the way if you allow it to get in the way. But what LEED really is, and the reason the youngest people are in this room, I believe, is it's 
sort of at the vortex of a movement. And if you look back at architectural movements, you look at the arts and crafts movement, you look at the modern movement, modernist movement, now you look at this green building movement, what you see is huge shifts in the way things happen because of all of these billions of little teeny things. Just think, little arts and crafts homes that happen, you know, that are scattered all throughout this country, even in Aspen, right? It's all because a group of people decided to start thinking the same way. So what we've heard a lot about, and I'll stop in just a second, what we've heard a lot about at this conference is policies, how do we change our institutions, how do we create new laws? That's all about sort of playing on our worst. Laws are what we do as a society to create sort of a common benchmark of what we think is the worst we can possibly do and still accept each other without throwing each other into jail. <laughs> right? But when, I, when my kids go to school and they come home, I don't ask them, did you obey every rule today? That's not what I ask them. I ask them, what did you learn? What was, what was exciting? What was real? What was true? What, what happened? That's what this green building movement is about. And that's where I think the whole potential is going to be. It's in the potential of the human spirit to care for each other and really generate an entirely new way of thinking out of billions and billions of little teeny actions that we create in our buildings and how we use them. And I would add that you've set a bar that says really what is a green building. You know, like that commercial, it doesn't say Haynes until I says it says, it says Haynes. That's what Scott and Scott, until Scott says it's green, it's green washing. And that's very, because America's very creative. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at every advertisement and every color that's used in marketing, everything is switched to green. So when we've just created Lee Gold and Lee Platinum buildings, we know what we've achieved and because you've set the bar. And we can tell you exactly what, what that means. But if somebody else says they do, they do leads or they do lead certified, then we know that they're just showing up and they really don't care. But that they're doing but there has to building. be a way so of saying a question out there. There has to be a way of saying what really is a class A building and lead really creates what a class A building is now. Hi, I'm Lindy Hoffman Nashville. Um, I'm the US Green Building Council a member and I'm an interior designer in sustainable practices. But I just want to address, because I'm very pro lead, I just wanted to know if you would address the criticism on the smaller level of the small developer or the small contractor who can who finds the lead program an expensive program for that for them to incorporate into some of their projects that are um, if you would address that criticism too. Well, there are a lot of cost issues associated with LEED, right? So um, a lot of times these cost issues get very confused with each other. There's the cost issue of registering and then certifying. And a lot of times in, a, like, in the kind of building that Jeffrey's talking about, it's not an issue. But it's a teeny fraction of a percent of the entire project. Of course, when you're doing a much smaller project, the proportion of those costs is higher. Um, although there's a sliding scale related to certification and, and regist not registration, but certification. But um, just to separate, out, separate that, there's, there's a total misconception that green buildings have to cost more. That's not what you're talking about, right? Right. Well, and, and, but in a way, you know, your, your question is a little bit like what you were talking about earlier, the problem in this country of it's all or nothing. Because you can do a lead building. You don't have to certify. You don't have to you know, go through the whole thing and, and that, those added costs that are expensive for a smaller one. I mean, you should still be proactive and do the right things and use LEED as a guideline. This is what we require of all right. our tenants, that they must meet the LEED certification, but they do not have to certify. Certify, <laughs> right. And they meet the bar. Well, it's, a, just sort of a, it's a new landscape for smaller communities, smaller developers, um, you know, small builders who are trying to navigate they're trying to navigate through, and they want to um, aspire to this level, um, at least, you know, get to bronze or something, but um, there, I think there's a certain intimidation by the costs and, of the process to go well, through that, and is there, uh, it just, I just want to know if you're addressing from lead. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just say really quickly then, I think there's a, 
there's often a cost for people that are doing this for the first time in, a, in terms of a learning curve. And Jeffrey has a great story about that. Um, but there's also then just the cost of certification. Again, I would argue that those costs are fairly low. They're pretty low. And when you do them consistently in a community and everyone has to do them, they aren't the issue at all. It's the issue of having to learn to do new things or having to learn that if you've used waterless urinals for the first time, you've got to spend a lot of extra time working against the people that are working, teaching the people. I'm sure you can tell us stories, right? <laughs> But teaching people, uh, uh, municipal authorities sometimes, or others that say you can't do that, or, and so, so you. how can we on a local, I'm in the Nashville, so how can we help those well, I, contractors that are just really intimidated? Well, I, I, first of all, I, 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 the key thing about LEAD that most people miss is it's an integrated process. And the success of mitigating cost is integrating early on. So, for instance, we have a, a in in Washington. I mean, we have four lead. We have one lead certified gold office in D.C., which I sit in, and then we have uh, uh, registered in Beijing, registered in Madrid, and you know, like three others in the U.S. And so, we, this is a policy for us to pr pursue. There's a size issue dealing with documentation and things like that. We still do. Um, um, you know, the, the commissioning piece because we know that saves us money in the long run. We still do the integrated process, but when we start, when we go out with a building to search for a building, we have the broker there, we have the um, project manager, the engineer, the architect, the lighting designer, the furniture person, we have everybody up front doing a charrette. And we found that has been so successful to mitigate the cost of doing something downstream. I'll give you kind of a, a, a really great example at the USGBC headquarters that was done early on in the integration process was that it's an open environment, but they discovered that if they set, th they set the, um, the, the open environment off of the window line, that they saved something like 30% in their heating costs because they, they didn't have to cool that window line the same temperature as the as the zone on the inside. It was just kind of a quarter zone. And so that offset of the inefficiency compared to the savings and energy, you know, was a great thing. The other thing that they're doing that, that's really, uh, you know, you'd never think of, but the structural engineer was there. They said, well, it's a, it's a Washington concrete building. And they came in there with, uh, they, they're using carbon fiber to reinforce the slab for a stair opening. It's a two-floor space. But it costs less to, for the carbon fiber. They, did, they could bring it up the elevator, basically, because it was light. Um, and it didn't change their ceiling height. So they could still have daylight penetration. But that's a good example of cost savings and you know, as well as better design through integrated design. And so I think one of the things that, that you can do is be, uh, you can have training sessions and charrette sessions on you know, how do you manage the, the lead process. That's a great idea. Right. I would just also add that um, you should not pay for other architects and engineers to learn about LEED. That is the requirement of the day. That's what everyone, that's why we have right. young people now. You, you pay the second, them to do documentation right. and that's, yes. that's it. The energy modeling and other things are actually extra cost, of course. But the other thing that you need to keep in mind, and also the materials, I mean, they're, they really don't cost much anymore. It's one, two percent. But what you really have to keep in mind, and I'm on the press constantly, is that if you don't need lead now, you're going to have to go back later because yeah. the buildings will cost too much. So no matter what anybody ever tells you about the upfront cost, you're going to keep paying and paying and paying. And eventually, those buildings will have to be abandoned because they'll be, they won't be affordable or you won't well, be able to get a, tenants. One of the things that we found in, it, in, our, in our building was that uh, we, did a, um, we did a daylight system, a daylight capture system and sensors and very energy efficient T5 lights. And when we did the modeling with the power costs at the time, it was a three year payback, then energy spiked 30% last year and so the payback became faster. For us, and so, and that's one thing you can anticipate. I think is that energy costs are going to still go up. I think we so have three other questions modelings. too. So, 
Um, I, I was curious. Uh, I know in Alaska we're really interested in lead or green design in general, and th there's been a problem integrating the lead system into the conditions there. There's a lot of remote communities. There's a lot of communities on the top <coughs> or above the Arctic Circle, and it's really difficult or maybe not practical to use the lead system as, as it is now. I was wondering if there's any. Um, movement or way, or maybe I'm thinking about it wrong, to apply like a, a process for green design in these types of locations or any way of modifying the current lead system, you know, to maybe be applied to more um, like a broader spectrum of climates and conditions. Igloos. No, just, just kidding. But, um, but, well, I would say just that lead, the lead 2009 that it gets launched April 27th, one of the big shifts in that is uh, basically a structural shift that allows us to make the system more nimble. So it's not a one size fits all. So uh, we've got about 14 different groups that want to adjust lead for their type of building type. And then we've added these regional credits to make, um, you know, make specific issues regionally more important. So, um, It'll take time because there's this huge interest in getting different versions of lead in there, but we do have a system now that can address that more easily, but I can't say that it would happen within probably the time frame you're talking about with those specific buildings. Question? Here. Thanks. I'm uh, with uh, American Forest Conservation Group in D.C., and one of the things I'm interested in would be um, the green infrastructure, the framework in the city for some of the, you know, the larger systems. And um, can any of you address um, some of that and how the you know, stormwater runoff and the siting of buildings and some of the, the larger planning or retrofitting of our cities for uh, you know, capture and use of stormwater runoff or in, in that roofs. larger context. <laughs> well, green roofs. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's a, I'd like to talk about uh, as much as I'm interested in LEED as a system, I think we have to talk about some other things. Uh, one of the problems that we face as a community is the, the difficult choice between uh, building design standards, st system and standard, or performance. And one of the biggest problems we have environmentally is offsite impacts. And of course, my community is a textbook about offsite impacts. 40% of our carbon footprint is the airport. So while we're doing a really good job, you know, we're 83% renewable in the city and, and this and that and all the statistics, we're always going to have that problem and, and have to work on offsetting that, but buildings themselves have offsite impacts. If you have a lead standard building but you build it in the National Forest seven miles from the nearest road, you're not doing the earth a favor. It, you're just not, because the offsite impact of the transportation hither and yon and, the, and so on and so forth, fairly obvious. In the city itself, it's not so obvious, but to merely to create a checklist uh, is, is to uh, run the risk that the subsequent owner is going to choose or the developer is going to choose to pass costs down to the next generation or to the community at large. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But one way to do is to, is, is to meet the checklist but not operate the building efficiently. And how do you go back in and see if the building was operated efficiently? It's very difficult uh, and very controversial. But, but if, if you had true performance standards, you said, you know, you can build this however you want. Here's a minimum standard. It's lead, silver, or platinum, or you know, quartz, whatever, whatever the highest thing is of the day. <laughs> but you said later, you said later, we're going to come back and audit you. There'll be consequences for use of the building. The difficulty, of course, is creating audit standards. So all what happens in a city requires that the public individually and as a whole think and think about the problem. Otherwise, each each individual structure is just its own little test case. And it may meet some standard, but it, it may not fit, it may not work, it may create offsite impacts. What we're trying to do in the city of Aspen is look at the city as a whole. You know, how do we, a developer comes in and they say, well, we'll do lead silver or something. And we say, well, fine. But will you agree as a condition of development to join a, uh, ground source heat pump district if we form one, 
or geothermal district if we form one. So that we have, we don't have the problem of the subsequent owner saying, well, that's, that's too expensive for me individually because I can't carry this on my own, but we, we have a collective in place approval for that system when it becomes feasible. And it takes a lot more forethought and a lot more planning that in America we're not used to. In America, you know, we're all, half of us, you know, get out of architecture school and we're still reading the fountainhead and we think that, you know. <laughs> we're going to design the power, right? Right. And, and, <laughs> right. Howard Rourke is going to solve this for yeah. us and because we're brilliant and the market will solve all our problems. Well, but, uh, but I, do, I, I do think that, you know, around you, you have the mayor's council that is, you know, and, and governors and, and they're very becoming very active and aware <clears throat> locally about how to, Build more sustainable and smarter cities. How to deal with urban sprawl? How to you know have uh, better transportation systems? The right kind of mix of density and things like that. I've you know when at, coming out of Washington, I've always argued that we have kind of an unsustainable city because we have a height restriction, and we just keep sprawling and sprawling and sprawling because we can't go t taller than the the Capitol building. So and so that's a problem for us, well, and we would be more sustainable if we could be taller. But one other one other problem that we have. In, in this country. It's called the 400 foot rule. Now, we're not here about transportation. I'm, I'm on the uh, stimulus package committee that nominates the transportation projects. I'm on the governor's blue ribbon committee that this guy recommends transportation solutions. Every single person involved in transportation planning that I know or who I would be willing to pay money to do transportation planning for me if I were doing that privately believes in the 400 foot rule. The 400 foot rule in America is this. Nobody will walk more than 400 feet from their car to their destination. Nobody will do it. And as a consequence, you have to plan your public facilities, your bus transfer points, and everything around the 400-foot rule. What you get from the 400-foot rule by having accepted that and having made that unchallengeable doctrine is sprawl. But, but and can you I... can have all the green buildings you want, but if they're all located 20 miles apart and I'm driving back and forth but, to them, but I'm, let, I've lost. Let's just look at one example, though, where they all fit together. And I'd say Portland, Oregon is a good example, where you've had a combination of very solid leadership that in the past set growth boundaries, and then um, very, uh, very solid leadership through a single governor and a couple of mayors that then took out freeways right along the river so there were walkways, started then creating public transportation so instead of the 400 foot rule reigning, you get people away from their cars so they can easily get in transportation. I know it's different in a city like Aspen. But, um, but then what you have is a city where all of a sudden you have tons and tons of lead buildings and you get this density of lead buildings where everyone jokes about the, the bicycle credit, but now you have in a, in a city where more people uh, per capita right, bike to work than any place else in the country. So you start to see everything working together as a whole. I completely agree that you can't just do it building at a time. And, one of the things, we have started addressing that, but I, I don't mean to make this so lead-centric either. But, but then there's, well, there's lead for neighborhood development. But Jeffrey, I mean, you've done some really wonderful development where you've done retention and, and you know, habitat development to sort of deal with s s things like this, you know, in the city. What's going to happen, uh, we're working on a project at, near White Flint Mall, which is a suburban area outside of Washington, D.C. There's a metro station. They are going to increase the dense the zoning capability, the build out of an area 2,000 feet in either direction, not 400 feet. They're going to add 15 million square feet to this one mile. And the reason that it will become successful, why people will walk the 2,000 feet, is exactly what Scott said, is that they're no longer oriented towards a car, and the 2,000 feet is a community experience. It's not just walking along a busy road. It's very much like you're walking along Aspen. Every, every place you turn, there's history, there's excitement, there's, there's people making businesses. And that's very much what, what will happen is you're going to be part of that community. You're walking past the people that you really are nurturing your community. And I think you're going to see, probably because you have to, 400 feet will expand. And also, there will be some other impact of that will actually get healthier if we get a little bit more exercise, like Switzerland. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. well, exactly. 2,000 feet, you say, exactly yeah. the distance the flat shirt, walking. sorry. Oh, yeah. um, so there you go. I have a question. <laughs> you were talking about the 2,000 watt rule, and in uh, 
2008, 2001. We've seen houses and everything else, but if, if uh, in America you said we're 12,000, hmm. how do you recommend, I mean, how do we change our human behavior to get it down to 2,000? Um, especially in America where we're the instant society where we turn on our TVs and a lot of us remember when the old days we turned on our TV, we had to wait for it to warm up and then it would come on. Now it's instantaneous. How do you recommend that we turn, change our human behavior to get down to 2,000? I mean, we're all willing to do sacrifices, but there's certain human behaviors that I'm not so sure we can change just because of the way our society is designed around it. Well, how, how do you recommend that in Switzerland? I don't know how to do it there, but I know how we can do it here. The first rule is like being a doctor, do no harm. And the first rule for me in public office is don't subsidize bad things. It's not a question of forcing people to do the right thing. It's stop paying them to do the wrong thing, and you'll make a lot of progress. It's not the whole answer. But in, in our country, that's a big part of it. But, I, but there, there's... We, we pay people yeah. to do the wrong thing. There, there, that's right. But, but you can, anybody can go to their power company and get an energy audit. Anybody in the country can do that. They can have recommendations about how to change light fixtures, how to, you know, you know, we have, in our house, we have light sensors on in our house because, you know, when my kids were little, they'd go in and leave the light on in the bathroom. And so we put a light sensor on. We're like, we're taking but, care of the well, problem. Yeah. But I think you ask a very a important question because <laughs> It's, it's not, a, not only about technologies and uh, sensors and, and, and subsidies and so on. It is as well. But I think it needs to really achieve a real change. It needs a new lifestyle. It, it, this lifestyle must be fun somehow. It, it's not back to the Middle Age, but it's, it's forward into a good future, colorful future. And that's what we now, what we try to uh, communicate to the people. We're just starting this lifestyle thing with, with people in, in Germany. And uh, the other thing is regulations. Uh, I don't like regulations neither. I'm, I'm a planner, I'm an architect. We have thousands of projects and we don't like regulations. But uh, maybe I, when we look back into the 80s, you know, uh, beginning of the 80s, as a consequence to the um, oil crisis we had in the 70s, this whole solar energy efficiency thing became kind of fancy. It was an in thing to have a winter garden, uh, and that, like Avery Lovins with his banana plants, and uh, to, to uh, save energy, and then suddenly. In the late 80s, everything changed because of a new president in the United States, you know, and the whole world follows you, you know, that's the point. Yeah, well, the whole I, I world think that, follows that the United we have States, different you know? expectations this time around. And so <laughs> this is a good moment to change again, but it needs a, a, a change in the mindset which has to do with a, with a lifestyle, that it is fancy okay. to do it. Michael. Right. Thank you. Um, we, and by the way, I mean, our, our time is really up. I mean, if, People have to leave. There, there's, I, I know yeah, how I know, frustrating know. it is when you Go <laughs> ahead, Michael. Questions. Cool. Um, two very quick questions. First, for Mr. Abrams, I just uh, would like to hear you talk about uh, Vedic architecture. Thank you. And, <laughs> and, sec and secondly, to the, to the panel at large, um, what recommendations do you have for catalyzing behavior change in people? I think I can address that. The Vedic thing. Yes. Yeah. So we're ready to go beyond green? Yeah. yeah. OK. So the, f the original title of this seminar was the, build the Cities of the Future. So I wanted to expand our concept of the Cities of the Future, where the future is how we learn how to harness nature's intelligence within the built environment so that nature works for us. OK? I think going around the room was a great idea, Sally. I've learned that we all seem to have more in common than just an interest in climate change. We seem to be more interested in a whole sea change. So I think that we, our cities need to go beyond the idea of just economical, ecological, and environmental balance. We need to address other requirements that really makes that city someplace that we all really are searching for. 
what the future should be. And that is a city that has no crime, that has no poverty, that we create health, we don't create misfortune. We, uh, we raise the educational outcomes. Our schools become centers of coherence. I realize schools and coherence you've probably never heard in the same sentence. Um, and, um, and also, is it possible that our cities of the future could make us more creative, more successful? And could it bring us good fortune and maybe even enhance spiritual fulfillment? Then I think we would actually have a healthy city. Also, I've been thinking about this. I think the future has to happen a lot faster. Does everyone agree? Yeah. And therefore, we need to build cities that promote our ability to change to change our minds, to let go, so we feel unrestricted in our potential so that we can create the future. Where poison is this notion of we, there's nothing that we can do, where we live in the idea of all possibilities. Is that possible? You know, when I was growing up, I always had this, I come from a family real estate, I learned real estate at the dining room table. So it's been very much in my blood and in my digestion, I guess, that I always saw real estate as really fulfilling a spiritual need because it brings people together. It's, we, we are not an agrarian society. We do everything inside. And we have this desire, this need to connect, to be part of the roots, be part of our history. And that's what we long for. That's why we're redesigning our cities and our smart cities now, is so that we have these common core areas. And so now I ask this question, is it possible to build the built environment beyond this one idea of connection, connecting to people, to where we connect our lives, our thinking, all our actions, so that it is connected to the very intelligence that runs the universe in perfect order? Is that possible? <laughs> and do we want it? So let's test it. How many people have been in a building that they just love? It elevates them. Do we all agree maybe we've not been in enough of those buildings? Absolutely. How many people have been in buildings that we find crushes us, we want to run away from? How many people work in those buildings? How many people have their children learning in those buildings? So what that means is you've just proven something, when I was talking about something so abstract, is that we respond to space. Human beings respond to space. And we all know what is a wrong space and what is a right space, and we feel it. It holds us back or it elevates the spirit. So, therefore, it must be true somehow, is there a science that allows the built environment to uh, to become a science where we can positively affect people. And therefore, how can we avoid the damaging effects of feeling that crushing aspect of life on life? Now, many years ago, about 12 or 14 years ago, I was introduced to a new science of building called uh, Vedic architecture, or Vastu. It's more commonly known, V-A-S-T-U. I was introduced to this by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who really restored this ancient science that had been totally fragmented. Uh, it had been negotiated down to whatever anybody wanted, and had its whole, very, whole possibility of what it really offered was completely gone. And as you may know, Maharshi also introduced the Transcendental Meditation Program, which uh, really he offered this Transcendental Meditation Program on the platform of science, published science, to show that its benefits to mankind. Now, Vedic architecture states, okay, you ready? Vedic architecture connects individual life with cosmic life. Interesting enough, in the roots of America are the Freemasons, who were the founding fathers of America. They have an expression about architecture, and it says, architecture is the intersection of the human and the divine. Architecture is the intersection of the human and the divine. This, the expressions are almost exactly the same. Cosmic life, the divine. 
What is that? And I think these expressions really give us meaning about thinking outside the box. And what cosmic and divine is, is means nature's intelligence. It connects individuals with nature's intelligence that is governing the universe with perfect order. In our latest building outside of Washington, D.C., which is also Lee Platinum, 200,000 square feet, we incorporated Vedic architecture principles into the building. And we focused on uh, watching the people who work in the building, and we focused on promoting the building to visitors so that people were exposed to a Vedic building and to a green building. Because a Vedic building is not an intellectual concept. It's experiential. You need no sign to tell you how you're going to feel in a building. You know it. And what people reported, and our employees reported, and our visitors reported, we have sort of melted it all together, is that people say they want to run to work. It's the first place they think of when they want to find peace in their life. They want to come to work. How many people have ever had that experience? Uh, that they've lost the sense of time when they're in the building. They don't watch the clock anymore. In fact, this has become a little bit of a problem in our office. People don't want to leave. There's more harmony between the coworkers. People want to work together in teams. People feel more calm. They feel peaceful. But at the same time, they're more focused. They're more creative. They feel totally unrestricted in the environment. It's, un it's almost inconceivable that walls properly designed, and I'll go through those details, that walls can make you feel unrestricted. And at the same time, walls can also crush you. You gotta get it right. Whatever, also, we found that people are more successful, they're clear, they're more ambitious, they're energized, and they also have this feeling of being nurtured at the same time. They feel like, like the wind is at their back. They have something supporting them. And that's the support of nature. Also, what people have experienced is that when they walk into the building is they feel this pressure off their chest. You know, stress is physical. It's crushing. And they feel this relief come over them. It's amazing that the built environment has been having these experiences on us year after year after year, generation after generation, and we may be finding solutions in the built environment to a lot of the problems we have created for ourselves. And um, as I said, we've almost had six to 800 people come through the building so that they truly understand what a green building is because it has to be experienced. And it has to be experienced through their senses. And almost everyone who comes into the building says, there's something about this building that I have never experienced in my life. Or, or there's some memory or just some joy that they find is right. And the building naturally gives that experience. I can tell you I have many green buildings. I'm actually the largest developer of green buildings in the Washington, D.C. area and have won every award in green. And I can tell you that green alone does not give this experience. And for businesses, what this means is that um, the building becomes an investment in human capital, which means it's also it's an accelerator of human potential. The, and therefore, we now create these new concepts called return on rent, where space can actually become, where you can get a return if you make the right choice on human capital. And why is that possible? Now, this is the fun part. This is where we talk about math. This is what motivates a lot of people. Energy is about $3 to $4 a square foot in the building. Let's call rent $40, $45, just to pick some number. Payroll is $400 a foot. $400 a foot. This whole conference is about the $3. Brokers are all about the $45, getting the deal. What the deal is, is, can I get a return on the $400 a foot that I'm putting out every year in payroll? And we're not 
we're not realizing what we're gaining out of that $400. So now, therefore, with Vedic, we have this idea that we can actually, every day, the building is beginning to work for you, enhancing the output of that $400. Let's say we had very, very low expectations, and there was only a 10% improvement in the productivity of people who have this kind of spirit to come to work and to stay at work. 10% of $400 is 40, which is basically the cost of the rent. So therefore, that expression, you get what you pay for, is absolutely true. And start multiplying that by every business in America or all over the world. Yet the Pentagon study actually showed that, that the whole Pentagon renovation paid for itself within two years, which was about five right. minutes per person per day, simply by making by changing abs absenteeism by 2%. Right. And this is very important. If you elevate human psychology, if you make people happier, they're less inclined to get sick. In America, we spend $2 trillion a year, every year, on responding to sickness. Where I come from, there's been a lot of talk about $789 billion fiscal policies, fiscal stimulus packages. One time over the next 18 months, we're going to spend $789 billion, and we're spending $2 trillion every year. Do you know how much $2 trillion is? I have to divide by 365, which number of, day, number of days in a year, and then I divide by 24. Then it means something. So if you do the math, it comes out to about $219 million an hour. There is no fiscal stimulus package to make us healthy. And that's why there's green, because it's affecting the environment as well as the inner environment. When you add Vedic, you're elevating you're allowing the person to get through life easier. And it's the stress that wears us out, that tires us, that, that debilitates us, and stress changes us. That's why we change. That's why we begin to think that we have such limitations. So I think it, it really shows you that we're now learning that architecture can actually sustain our aspirations. And when I grew up, that was my concept of buildings. Buildings were about architecture, which I love architecture, the beauty of architecture. But to me, buildings were about people bringing aspirations inside your building. In order to fulfill those aspirations, you have to fill the space with people to fulfill your business. That's why we rent office space, for people. Now, some people call that a fully leased building. And that's what it is. A fully leased building is a building filled with people. To me, I saw the purpose of buildings or anything that we build is bringing people together and seeing if I could build a building that would enhance the success of that company and allow those people to be more successful and therefore lead more enriching lives. So what's unfortunate is that uh, the, the uh, passionate developer like Jeffries doesn't really exist in this country anymore. We're, we're one with REITs and, and uh, f institutional right. funds and things like that. So. We have to somehow get that, that passion into that. Right, and I think that's why we focus so much on um, education. We found that by doing it and telling people that it can be done is a combination that's quite rare. And I've been very lucky. There's Elizabeth Oliver Farrell who's here who's handled all our public relations for the last six or seven years. I can tell you that we have been in every major newspaper in America. We've been on radio, we've been on television. There isn't anybody who doesn't call us, and that's because of Elizabeth's passion, because she believes that this is the way to really improve America and really touch everyone. So I know that we're, we're, yeah, running, we're, we're running out of time, and I was going to go into all the principles behind Vedic architecture, but may I just suggest, since you all are computer savvy, just go to the vedicarchitecture.com, I believe it is, or .org, anyway, it'll come up. Vedic is V-E-D-I-C. This is being incorporated in our building. It can, be, it can be incorporated in houses, and it can be incorporated in whole communities, so that we really are fulfilling this idea of ending poverty, ending crime, really improving every aspect of our lives. And then I think as a builder that uh, this is what I want to see built in America. We have to combine the great intelligence and and knowledge that we've learned about how to really use nature to help us and to allow nature to really harness us, to really make us more successful and more supportive. 
inside that environment all the time in our schools, in our libraries, in, our, in the places where we worship, where we work, where we sleep. That's the kind of city that I want to build, and that's the kind of city that's really going to be that rising tide that's going to increase the deservability of, of in any country where we want to make change, where we're not going to hold back change, and then I think we really created heaven on earth. Thank, Thank you, you very Jeff. much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, staying. Appreciate it. Well, it's fun. Is, is, there, is there room for a, an opposing point of view? Well, I, I, I do want to say something before we run off and build Vedic cities. Before, before we get to Vedic architecture, we have to find a way to reconcile our ambition with the basic fundamental American distrust and hatred of cities and buildings in general. And, architects. and archi well, architects are higher than lawyers, but that doesn't say much because I'm a lawyer. But in America, the tradition is cities are necessary evils, the den of iniquity. Uh, Thomas Jefferson put in the first Virginia Constitution that everybody would own 50 acres in the state of Virginia. Why? Because he thought that people who lived on the land away from cities were more moral. And to this day, mm -hmm. in this country, the only people that we really respect anymore, even though they, they are subsidized welfare class participants of the highest order are the farmers. Mm -hmm. So we, we sing and praise the agricultural interest all the time, and not deservedly so. They're no better than the rest of us, and in many ways more subsidized than any of us. Um, but the American tradition is, and the obstacle to creating big cities and good cities is, that cities are a bad thing to begin with and that they're never going to be any good. And the best place you can possibly live, the less city it is, the better. And when you walk out here and you check out the architecture, note for yourself the neo-Beowulfian fortress, old growth timber, shake shingle, stone, copper flashing to protect yourself from the dragon's breath when it attacks. The, the, the whole idea of refuge and retreat and privatization of the, of the sphere. And I think that is something that has to be considered before we go on to plan something that people mistrust to begin with. Maybe not rightfully so, but they do. Well, I make a personal invitation to you to come visit our building. I'll be happy. <laughs>